Mexico is a country of extremes. Three aspects to work on. Regulation. We need to have higher women representation in government entities to develop initiatives that support equally men and women. Society. We must unlearn to relearn new stereotypes. Women spend three times as much of their day doing unpaid jobs in Mexico. We need to work on children education to change that in the future. And third, companies. Economics of hiring a man or a woman should be the same. Therefore, policies such as childcare support, maternity leave, flex time should be equal to both and raise awareness of the unconscious biases that happen every day in the work life. Um, I have to say I'm, I'm honored to be here with you and to talk about what is probably the big issue, one of the big issues, the big elephant in, in this forum, which has to do with uh, health, women's health, and of course it is related to COVID-19. Um, I have to say I'm heartbroken that this issue once again has to be discussed. Uh, this issue comes up, I've been participating in these forums since 2006, and the issue of women's health comes up almost every other year, and every other year, there seem to be some advances. At least we were discussing the issue. I mean, come on. When you think about it, the fact that women had still have to demand health services in equal terms as men is, was insane in 2006, but when you think about it now, um, it's just, it breaks my heart, especially as it's happening with uh, the COVID-19. COVID so, Kiara, thank you for, uh, for the invitation and for organizing this forum, because it, this forum and, of course, this panel, because in many ways, I think, um, around the world, women's health has been taken for granted, right? especially right now, as COVID-19 continues to be one of the main Security, national security issues around, around the world. Um, so thank you. Thank you for your foresight and thank you for putting and, and inviting us all to be here. So I'd like to rapidly start with a, a comment that Audrey made the first day. She's, uh, she's the manager of the Women's Forum. And she talked about, and, and I was shocked and I actually went up to her and I said, Audrey, are you sure about those numbers? Audrey mentioned on the first, uh, first day of the panel, I don't know if you had the opportunity to hear that, that because of COVID-19, women's issues or equality that we're aspiring for women have gone back 36 years. Mm -hmm. And it's just, when you think about how one crisis, and it, it is a tremendous crisis, by the way, I'm not saying it isn't, but one crisis is taking us back 36 years. I think we still have much to figure out what does that mean in terms of access to health services and, and of course, the after, uh, aftermath of COVID-19 uh, COVID means for women's health. And of course, by the way, we're talking about women's health not only in terms of injections and medicine, we're talking about women's health in terms of mental health, we're talking about spiritual health, we're talking about physical health, we're talking about what this represents for their children. So I, when we talk about health, I think we have to be talking about thinking in big picture, big terms. Because if the, if the, if the mother or if the woman in the family is not healthy, the likelihood of the rest of the family to be unhealthy is very, is very, very high. So I, would, I wanted to make these uh, initial remarks before we started because we have an incredible panel today which represents both the role that the private sector can play and the role that governments plays. And there is a big issue that needs to be discussed. And it's kind of the issue that kind of follows us through all of these, uh, all of these panels. Who sets the example? Who f takes the first steps? Is it the government that takes the first steps? Or is it the private sector? And we can debate about that in other, in other panels and maybe we'll be able to uh, uh, figure out some conclusions and link it to the recommendations that are being presented to the G20 uh, call, call for action. So let's start, I, I would like to start with, let's talk about once again big picture. You know, what has been the impact of COVID-19 
on women's health uh, in, different, in different parts of the world. Um, so let me briefly present our, our panelists today. Joining us is uh, Maha Bint Mishadi Al Saud. She is a doctor. She treats COVID patients. She is vice president of Al Faisal University, consultant in internal medicine, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center. Also joining us today is Antimo Perreta. He is CEO at AXA Europe and Latin America. And Carla Bisotti, Carla, it's so good to see you, Minister of Health of Government of Argentina. So I guess, um, doctor, you have been treating COVID patients. What, could you just kind of put into, briefly put into context, what has COVID-19 uh, represented in general for women of your country? Um, actually, I can draw from my uh, previous experience mm -hmm. as um, the uh, uh, head of the task force, lead co-chair for task force number nine of the T20 last year mm -hmm. in uh, Saudi Arabia. We were um, hosting the G20. And that task force took care of women and young uh, societies, youth and, mm -hmm. uh, and women in migration, basically. So uh, this brought into, into context whatever uh, situation, political situation that has been happening, specifically vulnerable uh, seg segments of the right. population, which is the women and the youth. And when you speak about young women and uh, girls and young women, there's a lot that has happened to them due to COVID. And, and if you look at uh, different categories, I would think about it in like four aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, first is uh, economic. So usually women are, the la ladies are the ones who are most re uh, close to poverty. They are the one who are usually have the least pay. Mm -hmm. So, with the advent of uh, advancement of uh, COVID, they were the first to lose jobs. Also, they were again uh, first line for treat for uh, defending. They are on, on the front lines. Mm -hmm. So, seventy percent of uh, healthcare workers are women whether they are in the nurses, whether they are in the sector where they are creating, you know, the cleaning, food, preparation. And if you look at certain uh, statistics, you will see, like in Italy, more than when they looked at infection for more than 10,000 uh, people, 66% uh, in healthcare, mm -hmm. it was 66% were women. Same statistics were in Spain, more than 5,500 5, were looked at in healthcare work. 70% um, who got infected with COVID were women. Mm -hmm. So that was that aspect. And then you go into, uh, so that's uh, into the health, and you'll see that what happens is everything gets shifted. They do, their sexual and reproductive uh, health gets shifted because there is more criteria, there's something more acute, more mm -hmm. emergent, which is the COVID. So you see that the care for them, especially in mental or neurological issues and mental health, uh, they don't get the support anymore. Mm -hmm. you, can't, uh, you can't reach uh, you know, people who, who, who needs to help them. Mm -hmm. So that happened. Then you get the, which is what I think is very important is, and I want to bring to light here, is uh, women who are in uh, care work. So these, this category is very important, whether it is in, uh, in the formal economy, which are these ladies have, mm -hmm. are paid, whether they are nurses or teachers, these women are paid less than everybody else, unfortunately. And if you look at the informal economy, women are the biggest, uh, if you look, they are the, the biggest segment, 70 to 80 percent, depend on where you are, Southeast Asia or wherever. That's a big, and they've lost livelihood. And that segment, if they are working at home, and we all know, working at home, you are not paid mm -hmm. for chores. For, and then these children stayed home. So who's taking care of them? It's, it's women again. And for that, they stay home, they don't mm -hmm. go to work and they, lose, they mm -hmm. lose the job, it's very difficult for them to get back mm -hmm. to jobs. 
And then the fourth category, which I feel is, is uh, maybe the saddest, and that's exponentially has uh, multiplied, it's, it's the gender-based violence against women. Right. And you lock them inside the house with the abuser. So if you look at COVID, and that's how it has impacted women, and it has how it, it, their livelihoods, their mm -hmm. mental health, um, everything. I, I don't like to specify about, uh, you know, in my country, you know, I see, I see this as, again, this is a big global thing. And I think my country did a very good job during, for its leadership. And uh, if you look at the Nikkei recovery, uh, COVID-19 recovery index, which looks at more than 120 countries right. uh, in terms of rolling out vaccines, in terms of uh, treatment of infection, in terms of uh, management, uh, we, we came number two globally. So we did a good job because the, the government intervened. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the other statistics that you are looking into? It's a work in progress. We yes. are going to have to have We're a trying to, look. Yeah. Trying to understand. And I think part of the problem in trying to understand, I don't know what you think, Minister, um, and I don't know what the situation is in Argentina, but you know, we are already 20 months into the pandemic, and it is the issue. I mean, I think you've, you've done, Doctor, you've done a wonderful job in kind of laying out uh, issues that I think it affects most women in most countries. But the issue is having access to data to be able to start figuring out what do we do now. I mean, what, what is happening in your country? What is happening in Argentina? I don't know if there's other issues you would like to add. Yeah, thank you. First of all, you, you made the picture uh, great. You, you, you share the, the situation and the, the retrocede, and you share, I think that mm, most of the country has had to face during the pandemic, and women in, in all the country. So uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation for me as a decision maker woman, and also from a Latin American country. For Argentina, it's an honor to be here with you in this panel. Uh, thank you, Audrey, for your patience or, and your <laughs> excellent work, and Chiara, for the invitation. Uh, it's really important for my country to be yeah. here sharing uh, our experience. You know that Latin America has been beaten by the pandemic more than any other uh, continent, and also the access uh, of vaccines for, for Latin American country has also been difficult. So um, the, the situation was difficult before the pandemic. The pandemic didn't bring the inequities with uh, women, but Yes, uh, the pandemic made it deeper and, and more and more difficult, but it shows that we just have to work more and keep working to, to decrease this inequity. So in Argentina, just talking about the, the same problems that, that, that you share, the, um, the, we have a national line regarding uh, uh, to, to support women with, with, who suffer violence, mm -hmm. and only during the pandemic it increased 40% the, the wow. calls and the, the needs from, from women that were uh, quarantining the confinement with, the, with their abuser, the, the, mm -hmm. the men that, that, that violent her or them, and with the children in the same environment, and, and, and all this, this difficult that, that, that has been shown. But let me, know, let, let me share with you Argentina's uh, story regarding gender and women rights. We, we have a strong civil society that has been uh, lead the, the tradition of struggle for women rights, diversity rights, and uh, they, they have a, a very, very important component of self-supported and independent social movements that uh, has been very important for our situation regarding the, the framework. You know, I, I brought some, some dates just not to, to make a mistake. Uh, we, we, in Argentina, we incorporate the society's claim regarding the equal, equality, non-discrimination, and eradication of gender-based violence. And we really took this social process as a priority and a, and a state policy, and a public state policy. Um, we, we have a, a strong legislation uh, regarding rights from women and LGBTQI right. plus uh, people. We, we have, um, since, 19, since 2019, the Minister of Women, Diversity and Gender that was created for our, our, our current president. And we also mm -hmm. 
has a, a national law for a comprehensive protection to prevent, sanction, and eradicate gender-based violence uh, in their interpersonal and environment since 29, mm -hmm. since, uh, 2009. And uh, in 2020, we also work in, in the gender agenda at national mm -hmm. level with the 24 pro uh, provinces, and we launched the national plan on gender-based and diversity public health mm -hmm. policies. We work with the, between the Ministry of Health and the, the Ministry of, of Gender and, and Women and Diversity. Uh, we, this, this plan, the, the main objective of this plan is the implementation of gender-based and diversity policies in all areas of the Minister of Health mm -hmm. and also in the, in the 24 provinces and each healthcare center and with the uh, attention, primary attention care also, uh, so we can promote the universal access to comprehensive and quality healthcare. But is, that, is it working though? I mean, did that work? right now during the COVID-19, because what I'm finding out as I'm, you know, as I talk to, because I interview doctors almost twice, three times a week for my TV and my radio show, and what they're saying is even the infrastructures that were already there before COVID have rapidly disintegrated, that the yeah. government has had to prioritize almost exclusively on COVID-19, and what they're sacrificing is women's health. Yeah, we knew, you know, you know that, that we had the advantage that the creation of the gender and, and women right. minister was exactly at, almost at the same time that the pandemic started. So, so the, the um, feedback from the field, because we have the social society, right. the civil society that is very, very strong, mm -hmm. uh, and our minister of women is one of, the, one of them. She, she was ah. from the civil society. The possibility to strengthen is, and to create great. networks in the field, in the provinces, mm -hmm. with the government, was a, a very, very important opportunity. And we, we work with the national line number, mm -hmm. but also we work with the civil society and the networks, and we we um, uh, made the mm -hmm. the, um, the violence uh, based on gender uh, as essential sure. work, and so people could circulate, and, and women that support women right. can circulate, and the centers were open, mm -hmm. and it was, um, that's why we, it, it was not so, destroyed, but right. it was an opportunity. But it sounds like leadership and at least people in power, women in power, were making decisions to continue to support exactly. this even though there was a crisis. Let me ask you, from, from the private sector, I mean, what, um, um, Antimo, what happened in this, the, in the last 20 months in terms of the role of the private sector? I mean, did you continue to talk about women's issues? I mean, was that, or is, as everything else, everybody was only talking about COVID and every other, and women's issues and women's concerns and women's health were no longer a priority. What, and, and you can talk in general, I mean, not only your company. I mean, what, did you, what are you seeing? No, I, I just want to emphasize what um, I was saying that uh, during this uh, pandemic time, we have seen that uh, the, the, um, the gap between men and women in the healthcare sector uh -huh. uh, increased because you emphasize a lot of issues, financial, um, uh, also aggression at home, and different situation. And we have seen that because we have, uh, in the same time, we have done a survey. And to, to look, because we are paying, AXA is paying every year nine billion on, on, on claims in care. In, in, the health, uh, in the health sector. So we are looking all the time, are we spending this money the right way? And so, and during the survey, we have seen that a woman has postponed treatment mm -hmm. and even important checkups in the cancer. 40% mm -hmm. has really, really postponed this checkup. And this will have a problem in the long-term care, mm -hmm. but also, and believe me, in the pension because if you don't have now the right support in the medical part mm -hmm. and also in to get a job because you are healthy, right. then you will even have later than when you are retired problems. So this, this problem could be even worse. So what we have seen during mm -hmm. this, uh, this time is that mm -hmm. all the investment that we have done in the insurance sector uh, to do much more treatment by digital tools mm -hmm. has helped a lot because 70% of the customer would use our teleconsultation, mm -hmm. our symptom checker, all these digital tools mm -hmm. are women. 
So, and this was an important um, element that we will now even invest more to develop because to have access, mm -hmm. thanks digital tools, that, thanks all these digital uh, investments, it's much more easier to close perhaps a part okay. of this gap. And, uh, and uh, just to, to, to mention one element that uh, we have seen is that helping um, not only with uh, uh, doing digital, uh, um, digital consultations, but also helping the family mm -hmm. to doing babysitting for the children, right. to, to the drugs delivery at home because they couldn't go to the mm -hmm. pharmacy has helped a lot. So, and we have as a mission in our strategy mm -hmm. to help pe people to live a better life. Right. And this means for us to go beyond just the insurance contract, mm -hmm. to increase our contract with a lot of services. And this, I think, could be the help that the industry can bring to this situation. Let me, let me ask a question. How many of you, I'm just curious, how many of you postponed your medical checkup uh, in the last, um, in the last uh, 20, 20 months, or have not been, not been able to, or will not go do a medical check? It's pretty high. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's surprisingly high, because you know, in this group, that most of us have access yeah. to health care. So we're talking about at least, I don't know, I would say about 80% which is telling me that at least in this group, the possibility of some of us, you know, getting um, cancer, yeah, getting sick, or, or you know, in, and just post-COVID, which nobody's talking about that much, the post-COVID, long COVID um, is, is, is real. So we have the problem even among uh, women who, have, uh, who are, have access to resource. So I guess you, you started talking about some possible solutions. Um, Antimo, but I guess what we have to start talking about, so you talked about technology as a way of solving, not solving, but at least helping yeah. in trying to provide health care. Uh, is that, is, how much can technology, doctor, play a role in trying to at least, if not, not, you can't resolve it in the short run, but at least trying to assure women have access to health care? You know, this, we have to be more resilient, that's it. Uh, this thing happened right now, we don't know what the future is gonna look like. Mm -hmm. And if we, we take now lessons um, on how to, to manage it, we, we really have mm -hmm. to understand the nature of, of what's, what's gotten, you know, I had a patient who, who needed uh, a simple surgery to extract from their cheek a cancerous, uh, lesion and we had to postpone because of COVID and she lost her eye after three months. So mm -hmm. we really have to understand that this is really affecting people's lives. Now whether the next COVID or the next thing is gonna come, this is, we, we have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. And for me, the future is the digital, I mean, the employment of, uh, deployment of the digital platforms, mm -hmm. getting all the information, uh, creating these uh, programs where you are creating surveillance, you mm -hmm. are tracing, and it doesn't stop here. For me, uh, it's, it's a beautiful future because uh, it's, it takes me to precision medicine. Mm -hmm. So precision medicine is where you are employing machine learning to mm -hmm. decode the genome. Right. And this is where, you, where, you, um, where the future is going to go. So mm -hmm. everything is going to turn into that space. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think all the visits now, 70% of uh, doctors' mm -hmm. visits are, are getting to be on, on, uh, on Zoom, online. There are things that we can uh, make sure that we can do. And we can do things also better because now we, we know how to handle our time. Mm -hmm. We know, and we, the most thing, important thing for me that we understood at this point is that women are really vulnerable. And, and this has shifted so much, uh, the ground. And, and 36 years for me is, is not even, mm -hmm. I think it's 100 years. I, I, I agree <laughs> with you. I, I, yeah, you know, but what's interesting is it's hard to understand why more health services did not go online before COVID because there's been a lot of discussion of using te technology in the health sector and there's always been this kind of 
nervousness, and I, and I don't know, Minister mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and Antimo, what does that have, why? Does it have to do with privacy concerns? Does it have to do that you don't feel you're getting adequate medical care if you don't have a doctor uh, in front of you or a nurse talking to you? Um, I, I mean, what is, why has technology not been an important factor, one, in healthcare in general, because it would allow us to help more women, but more importantly, during COVID? I mean, I think there's been a lot of, in, attempts to make sure that people have access to health care and they're now using but why I, I think that it's not only patients or the healthcare workers and the healthcare system also have some resistance of for changes you know mm -hmm. some, some sometimes when when you feel comfortable although mm -hmm. it's not working great mm -hmm. uh, uh, changes are some sometimes a challenge but the pandemic came to make us realize that we are able to make these changes in mm -hmm. a very, very short period of time, sooner than we really or ever uh, believed that we mm -hmm. were going to be able to, to achieve these, these uh, changes and the, these changes of our behavior also. You know, in Argentina, mm -hmm. uh, we had a decrease of 60% of uh, screening for cancer, breast cancer wow. and cervical cancer and mm -hmm. 50 percent of decrease of uh, colon cancer mm -hmm. and today is the international day uh, in the fight against breast cancer so mm -hmm. uh, it should be a, a huge a call for action to to work on that the the to to learn lessons in order to to know that the technology will be uh, extremely important in the contact mm -hmm. in the in mm -hmm. the follow-up in prevention mm -hmm. uh, it's not only another i think that one huge challenge that we have is that population society um, believe that uh, to promote their health, to, 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 um, to uh, think that the health is important, not only when you lose your health, but when you are afraid of losing your health. So uh, healthy um, style life, uh, prevention, uh, control for chronic disease. In Argentina, we increased the 60% uh, the ICU uh, capacity and 70% the artificial because of COVID. Because of COVID, we right. we we strength the mm -hmm. the healthcare system and now we have a high mm -hmm. um, a percentage of, of internation regarding the delay demand. People who didn't access uh, mainly women, they didn't mm -hmm. access to the control or, or the attention. So mm -hmm. I I think that that. Um, uh, we we really need to to change this uh, threat into an opportunity and mm -hmm. keep working on technology innovation, but uh, with the with the um, people in the in the healthcare center with primary attention mm -hmm. and to to work together, society, mm -hmm. provinces, mm -hmm. national level, mm -hmm. also private sector, and of course men and women in order to to. See. This is this one of the areas, Antimo, where it would look like that you have private sector, civil society, and government having an extraordinary opportunity that is not, I mean, there, I think there is efforts out there. I mean, if you watch, I don't know how many uh, people coming from the United States or in the audience, but if you watch TV in the United States, there is apps for, you know, to get psychological care, to, to, right. to your heart rate. I mean, clearly there has been an incredible jump in people having access to apps. But of course, this is, has nothing to do with the government. It just has to do with profits and the idea that there is service and there is a need there. But I, I'm still surprised that that doesn't seem to be the trend in other parts of the world. Or am I wrong? No, I think, um, I think we learned a lot about this crisis, how we can manage this crisis. Because to manage the COVID-19 crisis was only possible because all the different sectors has worked strong together, because otherwise it was not possible to get it. And uh, to come back to your first question uh, about the technology, I think the most important issue is that people don't believe technology. People believe humans. Right. And that's, the, I would say, the point that uh, we should elaborate much more. Mm -hmm. But there are another element uh, that I want to also emphasize was that 50% in our surveys, women says that when they have contact with the healthcare system, they don't really take care about their pain. So, and uh, you have mentioned about the mental health issues, mm -hmm. and we are not speaking about mental health issues. If you have a figure, communication, 
to put this at the same level, it's important. And I think using technology, because you are a little bit more out, 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 know, um, anonymous, anonymous with you and your technology, you can do that, uh, and this can perhaps crack a little bit the use of technology much more. But in the end, mm -hmm. even in all the technology that we are using, in the end you have knowledge of doctors, of the hospital systems, because mm -hmm. you need this support. And this is the way that I think we can, we can go much faster, mm -hmm. but we should use this momentum because we have learned a lot about this crisis, mm -hmm. and now it's really, for me, important that we, we, we take the benefit of that, not only the problem, because I have listened a lot in the newspaper that mm -hmm. we should live with some type of crisis, even in the future. So mm -hmm. we should be prepared for the insurance sector, private sector, but also for the medical, for the government, mm -hmm. to, to be prepared for, to manage better this crisis. And I hope I'm wrong, but we never know. You know, what, what's interesting is, and, and perhaps we haven't even asked a basic question about this, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, to talk about health and violence against women, it usually didn't happen in the same panel. I mean, I think there has been a discuss the discussion of this has moved forward in the sense that violence against women is now also considered a health issue. And that, because, it, and this is important, because the solution of violence against women is not going to be a doctor. Right. And that's the problem of now having this discussion, is because now, we're, since we're putting it into the health sector, at least for now because of COVID-19, it kind of raises a question, what, it, what happens with the efforts that governments need to do in order to prevent violence against women and violence against children? So, we can talk about technology and we can talk about all these efforts, but at the end of the day, violence against women, which is a health issue, um, is not gonna be solved by doctors. And I think we need to kind of recognize that and, and, and lay that out on the table because it's the big pandemic. I, Mexico, it is horrendous what is happening. Um, and you can see it in the statistics, we can see in the numbers. So I think we need to kind of have that discussion. We have a couple minutes more. Um, what we should start talking about, we talked about technology as a, as a solution. What other solutions are out there that we should be considering or to assure, at least in the short term and maybe in the long term, that women have access to adequate health? I mean, suggestions, comments, call for action. Um, women have to be, in, in, in leadership position, mm -hmm. uh, where they are, any decision that's uh, affecting them regarding, I mean, this is what we have seen. If you, if you employ or uh, put any laws that do not mm -hmm. take into consideration a woman being mm -hmm. there in the leadership position, usually it can be harmful uh, or it will not achieve the best. So, mm -hmm. so they, that's very important. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, you have to apply a, a gender lens when you are uh, looking at rolling out right. uh, programs, uh, aids, or or you know social uh, uh, any any kind of uh, support. You have mm -hmm. to have a gender lens that mm -hmm. looks at that and makes sure that it advocates for women, for young girls, mm -hmm. for. And this is not not me. It's the United Nations, uh, you know, brief. They, this, these are very important issues that they have mm -hmm. to be part of. They have to, they have to have a voice and, uh, and, and to be able to create that uh, space where they are mm -hmm. able to affect and change whatever is on the ground. Right. Yeah. Minister. I, I think that um, in, in every, uh, in each uh, public policy or decision, mm -hmm. It should be the the a woman view because if not something is missing you know is you you can have um, the best men and you can have mm -hmm. the best um, uh, professionals but but if if a, a woman woman mm -hmm. view is missing is something missing right. just because of the experience because of the view because of the difference that makes right. us being complementary, you know, uh, in the decision maker making policies in the places to make decision, you need to have 
gender parity, you need mm -hmm. to have same pay for the same uh, work, you need to, to really work in a, in a very integrated way uh, with the government. It should be absolutely a, a state decision, a state mm -hmm. policy. Uh, the government mm -hmm. should be involved, but also the private sector and but also the, the professional society, the civil society, and in a, in a federal country as mm -hmm. in Argentina and many of our countries, uh, they, they should also should be involved the provinces and mm -hmm. the municipalities. Um, just seeing the, the, the healthcare system regarding violence, right. we should train the healthcare workers because they, they should be um, trained uh, in identify this uh, violence and the gender violence just to to work with another professionals, not only doctors and nurses, but also sociologists, psychologists, and of course, mm -hmm. uh, so, um, uh, social support to, to these women. But uh, just the call for action is that we need women in, in decision positions, mm -hmm. uh, because we need our point mm -hmm. of view, our view of the solution. Mm -hmm. Antimo, I wanted to ask you, um, in addition to other suggestions, but I wanted to ask you about this um, this proposal, and if you haven't seen, you should you should definitely be reading and uh, the women's forum. Not all, um, the 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 document that is being produced by the the women's forum and the recommendations that are being made to the G20, and it has a, a very interesting recommendation, and it's it's not COVID nineteen specific, but it clearly is going to be linked to COVID nineteen just because of of the crisis, and basically the recommendation is to allocate, it's recommendation six um, in this document, so um, allocate 10% of the national health budgets to the research related to female specific disease. And I just have to imagine that, you know, in this situation, of course, G the G20 was probably gonna see, start thinking COVID again, which is natural, kind of the short-term crisis. But could you explain how would this work this, the, when you talk about these types of, this type of proposal, which I think is needed, uh, the question is how can we make it short-term results and not long-term results? Yeah, I can just tell you what my company is doing. We are supporting um, a research lab at the Bocconi University in Milano. Mm -hmm. So we are doing a lot of research because you will, you will learn a lot. You will learn the language, the issues, the problems. Mm -hmm. And with this study, we can help to support the culture change because it's a culture in education. To, because to, to stop violence, we have to educate the people mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, the primary school, mm -hmm. schools. So there are a lot of investment that should be done by the government. But also what we are doing, we are spending a lot of money every year on the mm -hmm. research. And this study helps us to understand what type of solution we can bring to our customers, mm -hmm. but also to the society, because we, we see also that we have a role to play mm -hmm. in our society. And, uh, and concrete, what we are doing is, that, an example, through, thanks to this research, we have uh, um, by some diagnostic center, clinics, hospitals, in some area where the medical care system is not very mature. And we have dedicated square meter for, for women, for specific topic for women. I think these are the elements that you learn from the research. So I, I, I really encourage governments to spend, I don't know if 10% is enough or not, it depends, but to, to really to learn about this research and to make sure that we are building the future. Because if we want to have a woman as a leader in our economy, mm -hmm. we need to look that they can stay healthy. And to do that, we need a, a system that is working in this direction. Mm -hmm. And what we're also doing is uh, digital. We have uh, a, a program with Microsoft, the digital health platform to build. And I will personally look much more in the development of products specific for women because 70% of the women has used the technologies. Huh. So, so this is for me. Could you repeat that 70%? Yeah, during the pandemic, 70% of the use of the teleconsultation symptom check are, are, are women. So for this reason, we see that this could be perhaps uh, the solution that we have mm -hmm. to investigate or to invest in more. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we will continue to invest in, in, in developing 
this, this type of, of tools, but at the end we need also government that helps us with some, with some rules, because if you have a data protection that is clear and important rules, but sometimes it's not helping in all the detail mm -hmm. to make sure that you can use more data. So mm -hmm. there are some elements that we have to work much more, but I think there are three things that I would do much more research, so I support it invest much more on digital mm -hmm. and dedicated space for women in the healthcare system because this is really needed. We have two minutes left and I always like to open up. Is there any questions or any comments before we, uh, before we finish? I know it's kind of uh, fast. Um, oh, yes. We'll take, we have one question here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking care of the women. But most importantly, France, for the first time in the history of France, uh, children from 9 to 11 were committing, wanting to commit suicide. So many of them have been put into asylum. Mm -hmm. We talk about the women, but what are we trying to do for the children and accompanying social or psychological care? because. The women have to handle everything, but the children are also affected. Thank yeah. you. You know, they, the Lancet came out, and I'm, right. we're going to find out, came out with a report on countries where, and, and we were debating how they did the research, but beyond the debate of the research, the countries that have come, um, I believe that the, the study believes that there is the highest rate of mental uh, issues. So the question, and so, we have the information, or at least there's some information out there that there is some indications that this is going to be catastrophic. Any comments? I, I, do you want to? Do you have any anything that you would like to comment on on her statement? I mean, no doubt that that would be the main challenge in the post-pandemic period. Absolutely, it's going to be mental, yeah. mental, uh, mental, so and 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 the the, the chronic disease. Um, advanced chronic disease diagnosis, mm -hmm. it would be a, a problem for the, for, the public, for the public health for sure, yeah. And this is, it's short term and of course it's then reflected yeah. long term. Absolutely. We ran out of time and I'm so sorry about that. I want to thank all uh, three of you. It was a fascinating debate and it's, uh, I'm glad there is a proposal at least that countries start spending more money but I think also this is a, an enormous op opportunity for civil society, because you mentioned civil society's role and, and the private sector, to use this moment uh, to be able to restructure the way we receive healthcare and hopefully pay more attention to healthcare issues that affect women. Thank you all three, and thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.